So this semester, as has been mentioned every week, we are confronting Old Testament controversy. Which means that each week we are focusing on a controversial question related to the Old Testament. Um, and uh, to quickly recap, we discussed the text of the Old Testament the first week. We spent three weeks on evolution, creation, origins, and now we are focused on the question of Israelite origins, specifically. Um, so these questions relate to, did the Israelites exit Egypt, was what we discussed last week, the uh, reality of the Exodus. Today we'll talk about the historical reality or unreality behind the conquest of Canaan. And then two weeks from now, we will then do perhaps what I consider to be one of the most significant biblical objections to Christianity, which is uh, the morality of the commands given in the conquest narratives. Um, we'll, it'll be tempting to discuss that tonight because some of the texts that we will be looking at are very unnerving, to say the least. However, we are only going to focus uh, this time on just the historical realities. So just as a quick recap of last week, what we discussed related to the Exodus is that the Exodus from Egypt is a central historical touch point in the theology of ancient Israel. This is something that the psalmist looks back on and the covenants are based on as well. Uh, it penetrates every strata of the Hebrew text. Secondly, and this is what's probably unnerving, is that there's no direct uh, archaeological, external, non-biblical evidence for the Exodus. However, we have to resist the urge to go to sensationalism and start talking about things like chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea or other exaggerative claims. Those are not helpful. Um, in fact, they can actually be detrimental to uh, one's credibility. So instead, what we talked about is how on the textual basis alone, the Exodus, since it has such a strong uh, permeation in all strata of the Hebrew uh, identity, both in the text, in the culture, that there is a good reason to think this is in the uh, category of what's called a cultural memory, which is a shared national experience that has been uh, um, uh, propagated through, uh, throughout the ages, generation to generation to generation. Uh, so the formal version that we looked at was what was called the Kazari Principle, was a guy uh, named uh, Tyron Goldschmidt, and basically he talked about uh, the three main conditions that can be met whenever a nation's uh, tradition can be accepted to be true. And more or less, it's just that the entire nation accepts it and that um, it is, it, it's the type of event that you would expect to have uh, lasting influence and that um, there aren't any significant uh, competing theories to it. Um, the example that we have here in the United States would be something like the Civil War or even the Revolutionary War. The majority of us do not believe the Revolutionary War happened on the basis of external evidence, but really on the testimony that we have of our uh, um, uh, forebears in this country. So more or less, that's kind of the same basic argument that we can give for the Exodus. In addition to that, what little bit of the story can be corroborated by external archaeological data fits fairly nicely in the overall scheme, uh, scheme of things. So we talked about uh, the Merneptah stele, for example. We talked about the Asiatic slave trade during the Middle Kingdom of uh, Egypt. Those types of things fit the background. There's no piece of papyrus that has, you know, Moses was here written on it. But there are general trends, if you will, in the area that uh, makes sense for the, for the Exodus. And then the last thing we talked about last week was about how the Egyptian influence on the Hebrew text is undeniable. And so uh, Hoffmeyer, James Hoffmeyer, who is uh, one of the sources that we cite fairly regularly in this discussion, has this quip saying that there is little external evidence of Israel in Egypt, but there is extensive evidence of Egypt in Israel. And as an example, uh, one particular uh, piece of, uh, of uh, evidence in, sorry, one particular line of evidence for these Egyptianisms are the names that are used by uh, the tribe of Levi. So there are eight Egyptian names that are attributed to the children of Israel. All of them are in the house of uh, Levi. We also talked about the specific nouns and uh, verb forms that are used in the Moses birth story and how they also have ties to Egypt as well. But I think this one is a little easier to grasp than, than that one. Now, a few corrections and addendums. So last week, I uh, kind of brushed over this distinction. I said something about a smaller exodus being a Levite exodus and another exodus being the house of Joseph. Uh, 
So these are actually two independent theories that I mistakenly conflated together. So basically, a lot of scholars do not find the mass exodus hypothesis of literally 600,000 men plus women and children and animals. Um, nobody actually thinks that that is literally occurred in history. Uh, it would require, uh, it, it would be nearly two million people that would be in the desert. And that's just something that is so fantastical that not even the most conservative scholars would, uh, would argue for that. Um, but under the different versions of smaller exoduses, there are different flavors and permutations of that. So one of them is uh, by this guy. Uh, oh, actually, I didn't bring it. My mistake. Uh, one of them is by a fellow named Richard Elliott Friedman, and he argues, based on the Levite evidence, he says that all the Egyptian names that show up in the uh, Hebrew text, they all belong to the house of Levi. He makes the argument from there, and then some other lines of data as well, that perhaps the house of Levi was the only uh, exodus group. And so they exited um, from Egypt, went through uh, the Sinai uh, Peninsula, they came into the land of Israel and connected with the rest of uh, uh, what would later become the nation of Israel. That's one independent hypothesis. Another hypothesis is suggested by William Deaver, where he says it's the house of Joseph that he thinks was uh, probably the, the central group. And this argument is primarily based on the fact that nearly 30% of the entire book of Genesis is just focused on Joseph and his story, which is something that seems a bit peculiar if you are a people group that... Um, are made up of 12, uh, 12 different um, uh, um, heads of the family. So he basically says that this disproportionate attention to the house of Joseph suggests to him that perhaps the Exodus group was uh, um, tightly associated with them. So those are two independent theories. Um, the books there are uh, Friedman's Levite Hypothesis is the Exodus, How It Happened, Why It Matters, and Deaver's um, book is uh, Who Were the Early Israelites and Where Did They Come From? And uh, that's where he kind of suggests that. He doesn't really, he's not married to the hypothesis. He just sort of throws it uh, out in passing. The other correction I have from last week is I kept saying Minerpta Stella, which I did not realize I said that. It's supposed to be Mernepta or Marinta. Those are alternate uh, pronunciations. Okay. Again, this is uh, Friedman's uh, hypothesis there for the Levite one. Okay. So that was last week. So now, after the children of Israel leave Egypt, then they wander around in the Sinai Peninsula, and then we have this uh, rather unnerving conquest account in Joshua. So this is what we will be talking about. Another review from last week are the principles for analyzing the biblical text in connection with the archaeological data. We have minimalism and maximalism. Minimalism, of course, is guilty until proven innocent. The Bible is wrong unless we have external corroborating evidence. Maximalism says, uh, innocent until proven guilty. We'll take the texts, if they're trying to communicate something historical, we will accept them at face value unless and until we have a reason not to. And our approach is responsible maximalism, so we're not going to say, uh, we're not gonna stretch the text to the extremes, we're just going to say that these are plausible historical events and that the archeological data, um, insofar as it is relevant, matches up to what we're uh, talking about. So again, that's Hoffmeyer's approach there. Um, and that's more relevant for the Exodus than it is for what we're going to talk about today. Um, again, sources and recommendations. So Hoffmeyer, Longman, and Kitchen are going to be our main guys. Um, and these are the three books that we'll be returning to. Okay, so outline. First, of course, intro and overview to the issue. Then we'll do the same thing. What does the Bible say? What does uh, the archaeological uh, data say? All right. So, quick history for you on the crisis of Israelite origins. So at the beginning of the 20th century was whenever archaeology really took off in uh, particularly biblical archaeology. And this name up here, William F. Albright, you cannot read anything about the Bible and archaeology without encountering him. He was uh, easily the, mo the single most influential person in biblical archaeology and essentially started the field. Um, and, he, and since he was so influential, any idea that he had was basically accepted as orthodoxy uh, right up until he died in sometime in the 60s or 70s. Um, and so in particular, he promulgated what became known as the Exodus Conquest Theory. And basically saying that there was a big giant Exodus and the children of Israel all rushed into Canaan uh, and completely obliterated the population in a swift, unified military takeover 
sometime towards the end of the 13th century, uh, which is about 1200 BC. In particular, this was based off of his personal excavations at Gazer, Lakish, and uh, Hotsor. Sometimes this is pronounced as Hazor. Just as another note, the pronunciations today are going to be all over the map, both literally and figuratively. Um, so if it sounds weird, I'm just doing the best I can. Um, and then, uh, so Albright died in 1971, and, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Other people started digging in uh, Syro-Palestine, that's Syria and uh, modern-day Israel, and they started finding some inconsistencies with Albright's uh, suggestions. But because he was so influential, they kind of just held their tongue. And even right up until, like, 1981, there was a history of Israel that was written by a guy named Bright, forget what his first name was, uh, and basically, his introduction to the history of Israel, academic text, took as foundational Albright's Exodus Conquest theory, as, as late as 1981. But in 1982, just about, uh, almost that quickly, the entire uh, edifice of the Exodus Conquest just tumbled down, like the walls of Joshua or of Jericho, if you will, just completely fell apart. So in particular, the destruction layers that he found at Gezer, Lakish, and Hatsor, there was no actual clear evidence that they were directly attributable to the Israelites that were coming in. Could have been the Egyptians, could have been anybody else. The other thing that was kind of peculiar is that the Egyptians exercised a hegemony over the entire region of Canaan up until about 1200. So if we have this massive military force uh, under the leadership of Jericho, why on earth do they never encounter the other major military force, namely uh, the uh, Egyptian army. That seemed very peculiar. Uh, the other thing, too, that this is something that I've, um, I'm going to mention in passing, and we're not going to talk about it much today, uh, just because it's so granular, but there's no clear break in the material, material culture uh, as would be expected from a mass invasion. In other words, there's a lot of pottery. It basically comes down to pottery and the shapes of handles on jars. This is really what it comes down to. It is the most tedious, mind-numbing thing in the world. But essentially, when you look at the pottery from about 1500 BC all the way up through about 1100 BC, there's no like clear break where the indigenous Canaanites stopped making pottery their way and then the Israelites started making pottery their, uh, their own way which is what you would expect if there was a massive uh, influx of you know, military conquest. So in response to this, a bunch of new theories kind of emerged to replace this giant Exodus conquest, um, and they're all variations on a theme. Basically that the Israelites more or less peacefully infiltrated into Canaan, or they just were Canaanites and kind of slowly grew uh, more and more separate from their uh, brethren. We're going to return back to these specific theories at the very end whenever we start evaluating the data more holistically. But they're basically just saying that the Israelites emerged. Okay? Um, so uh, this particular uh, theory, I think a really good example, uh, or a good encapsulation was Albright's student. This is George Wright. Um, and basically, he, the way he summarized it is, the books of Joshua, Judges, and Samuel carry the story from triumph to triumph until even the greatest of Canaanite walled fortresses were destroyed, Lachish, about 1220 B.C. Um, so to read it that way, you would think, wow, big, massive, invasive, uh, invasive force. Um, however, uh, here's how Hoffmeyer summarizes the, the situation. So he says that Albright and Wright, the, the synthesis was rightly challenged by virtually every uh, recent scholarly investigation. And... Um, Part of the problem that Hoffmeyer finds with this is that the Baltimore School, which is just basically Albright's school of thought, uh, they called it Baltimore for one reason or another, um, since they took this sort of moderate maximalist approach, a lot of the critics of the conquest model came to think that the conquest model was identical to the biblical account. So to them, to uh, critics' minds, a repudiation of, the con of Albright's conquest model was itself an abrogation of the uh, biblical matter or the biblical account itself, but Hoffmeyer says um, basically what the he he encapsulates what the standard response was from the maximalists in the 80s, which was before we just dispense with the biblical narrative and uh, start going with one of these alternative theories. Really, what we should do is uh, examine the biblical text with respect to the Albright synthesis to see if these two things actually do match up with each other. Um, and that is uh, 
what we're going to do uh, next, which is survey exactly what the Bible says about the, the conquest. Um, there's a comment in the Zoom. If I remember correctly, Albright was at Johns Hopkins, which is in Baltimore. Uh, I believe that is correct, yes. Uh, Albright was in there. Um, are there any comments before we move into the biblical data, uh, just on this broad overview um, of things? No? Okay. So let's talk about the biblical text. All right. What does the Bible say? It's a great question. Um, so one thing that's important is uh, when we read these texts, as we said at the very beginning of the semester, especially on the Genesis 1 through 11 uh, meeting, genre is so important and careful reading is so important. So what does Joshua's account actually say? Well, first, Joshua 10 is uh, a great summary of this. So Joshua 10, uh, 40 through 42 says that Joshua defeated the whole land, the hill country, and the Negev, and the lowland, and the slopes, and all of their kings. Here's the important part. He left no one remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed. Joshua took all these kings and their land at one time. So based on this verse here, it sounds exactly what Albright and Wright were suggesting. Triumph to triumph until everything is annihilated. Well, if you look a couple of verses earlier, you see a uh, description of one of these battles. So this is Joshua 10, same chapter, just 20 verses earlier. And it says here, when Joshua and the Israelites had finished inflicting a very great slaughter on them until they were completely wiped out, and when the survivors had entered into the fortified towns, all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. No one dared to speak against any of the Israelites. So I put the color here to make it pretty clear. They struck them until they were wiped out, and then the survivors entered the fortified town. On the face of it, that's a direct contradiction. How can you wipe out a group and there also be survivors? The next chapter, Joshua 11 as well, also says something similar. Joshua took all their kings, struck them down, and put them to death. Joshua made war a long time with all of those kings. There was not a town that made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, and all were taken in battle. For it was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts, so that they would come against Israel in battle in order that they might be utterly destroyed and might receive no mercy but be exterminated. So here, another kind of speaking outside of both sides of your mouth there. Joshua made war a long time, but earlier in Joshua 10, it says he took all these kings in one, uh, it, at one time. And perhaps I think the most transparent one is just Joshua 13. At the de When Joshua dies, it says here, Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, Joshua, you were old and advanced in years, and very much of the land still remains to be possessed. So in Joshua's account, in the space of two chapters, 10 and 11, and in the space of three chapters, including his death, we have, on the one hand, this clear, like, how more explicit can you be? Utterly destroyed all that breathed. But on the other hand, we also have survivors, uh, a long war, and much of the land that still needs to be possessed. So what do we do with this? So um, I would recommend, uh, this is a, actually a blog right here um, that I borrowed from pretty extensively in the format. His name is biblicalhistoricalcontext.com. It is a blog run by a hobbyist, which is actually more than I could say for myself. But he actually, um, this is a very accessible summary uh, that he goes through Joshua 10 and 11 and actually analyzes all the elements of genre. I'm just gonna give you an overview, but if you wanna go a little more in depth, I recommend this series. I do not recommend his conclusion. He definitely goes a little more, uh, um, uh, I guess, skeptical than I would. Um, but just crediting my sources here. So the primary book, the scholarly book on this is Ancient Conquest Accounts by K. Lawson Younger. So we have to look at the genre of what's being told here. So if you remember when we talked about Genesis 1 through 11, that was what we call proto-history or mytho-history, which means that it doesn't play by the same rules as contemporary 21st century historiography. Well, Joshua 10 through 11, um, people often ask this question, where does the myth end and the history begin? The, the answer to this is that you're probably not going to find a boring, straightforward 21st century historiographical approach uh, anywhere in the Bible because it's anachronistic. Joshua is no exception to that general rule, but it is an exception because it's not mytho-history. This is not a myth in any sense of the word. This is an ancient conquest account. 
which plays by its own entirely different set of rules. Um, and there are a couple of indications that this, this is what's going on. So the first is repetitive language. The phrase utterly destroyed, this is just Joshua 10 through 11, mind you, but this goes, it goes further than this, but this is just a particular example. The phrase utterly destroyed is used 10 times. With the edge of the sword is eight times. Left no survivors seven times, just as he had done two, et cetera, is eight times. I'm sure most of you have noticed this when reading the Bible. It gets repetitive at times, and that's actually a message uh, about the genre. The other significant uh, uh, data point here is uh, annihilation language. So just like we said, he left no one remaining but utterly destroyed all that breathed. Another one is hyperbole. So if you remember, we talked about how Joshua went out and he struck down all of the kings and uh, struck down everything until nothing was left alive uh, that breathed, and then said, and all the Israelites returned back safely to Makeda. So if we summarize all of, and, and that's how many of these accounts are. So if we summarize it, it goes like this. All Israel took the whole land at one time and killed every last Canaanite, and there wasn't a single casualty amongst the entire Israelite army. That is very clearly hyperbolic language. There's no way that's literal, especially since the accounts themselves talk about some defeats and they talk about some uh, casualties. Um, this last one is a little bit more difficult. It, you would have to read uh, uh, extensive. You would have to read extensively throughout the entire book to really get kind of the macro view here. But um, essentially, there's a common structure. So one data point I left out that's important. Um, is that the conquest is not a single military campaign, but it's actually three campaigns. The first part is uh, the Transjordan campaign, which is led by Moses. That one we are not going to discuss at all tonight. It is its own archaeological bugaboo that's separate. Joshua led two other campaigns, though, the southern campaign and the northern campaign. Now the, strat now, the topology, the geography, the people they were talking about, and the strategies that were used in the southern and northern campaigns were completely different. Um, and I mean the topology especially, but they both are told in exactly the same structure, which this is something you can only really appreciate if you uh, read it like several times and then really dig into the archaeology. We're not going to go into much detail there. There's a question. Could you clarify what, by what you mean uh, by topology in this context? Oh, topology, right. So the, uh, the northern campaign, oh, I'm really going to screw this up now. So the southern campaign is uh, primarily in the uh, region of the Negev, which is usually mostly flat with a couple of hilltops. The northern campaign takes place in the uh, highlands of, um, of uh, Judea, or not Judea, sorry, Judea is the Southland. The northern campaign is in the uh, Palestinian highlands. So the, there are more hills and things of that nature. Okay. Um, and then the last bit here is there's a unique focus on the military leader. So between Joshua 10 and 11, there are about 50 verses. There are only nine that don't reference Joshua. Now, you might think that's obvious. He's the military guy, right? But think of how much focus that you could put on God himself, the Israelite people in general. You could talk about the enemy. But instead, the focus is exclusively, or not exclusively, but the, the uh, focus is very strongly on Joshua. And as a very good example of this, um, I'm assuming a little bit of knowledge on everyone's part here, but there is uh, a passage where the sun stands, stands, sorry, the sun stands still at the request of Joshua so that they can keep fighting a battle. But if you notice the theology in that verse, it says, there has never been a day like it uh, before or since when the Lord heeded a human voice for the Lord fought for Israel. In this verse, that whole thing was actually uh, interpreted to be a commentary on Joshua as a military leader and not as God as the leader of the, uh, uh, of the um, conquest. So that's an, in, that's an important bit. So all told, so let me summarize these five points. We have repetitive language, we have the annihilation language, we have hyperbole, we have a common narrative structure despite differences in strategy and uh, conditions of the battle, and we have a unique focus on the human military leader. These are five genre indicators that what we're dealing with is an ancient conquest account. So I um, see some people taking notes, so I'll, I'll give you a moment to, to, to write that down. Now what we're going to look at here in a, in a bit, and what Lawson Younger does in, uh, in his book, is he uh, starts surveying different ancient Near Eastern texts that sort of play by these similar, similar rules. 
just like we did with the myth of history in Genesis 1 through 11. We looked at uh, the Enuma Elish. We looked at the um, Sumerian king list. Uh, likewise, Lawson Younger goes through uh, several other battle reports and points out these similarities. I'm going to focus just on the annihilation language because I think that's the easiest for us to, to understand. So um, we've already mentioned the uh, Merneptah Stele a couple of times. This is an account of Pharaoh Merneptah uh, and his invasions and incursions into Canaan. And so he says specifically, plundered is the Canaan with every evil, carried off is Ashkelon, seized upon is Gezer, uh, Yanoam is made as that which does not exist, Israel is laid waste, his seed is not, all lands are pacified, all lands together are pacified, everyone who was restless, he has been bound by the king of upper and lower Egypt. So he's saying, I annihilated Israel. Then Israel proceeds to con exist for several more centuries. I mean, this was in 1200 BC. They didn't even have a monarchy until 200 years after this. Um, another really good example is, uh, this is from the um, Harris Papyrus. Uh, this is from Ramesses III. And he says here, I slew the Dinian in their lands while the uh, Shecker, I think is how that's pronounced, and the Philistines were made ashes. The Sheridan and the Weshesh of the sea were made non-existent, captured altogether, and brought in captivity to Egypt like the sands of the shore, and I settled them in strongholds bound in my name. So literally, in the same sentence, I made this people group non-existent and then enslaved them. So this is the type of language that we see in other military, uh, in other conquest accounts, and we see it exactly here in Joshua uh, 10 and 11 as well. So why, is, why are we giving this so much attention? And this genre analysis, why is this so important? So if you recall, uh, our general presuppositions here are that the Bible is inspired and that the Bible is inerrant. So organic inspiration of the Bible means that God uses human authors and uses the situations that they are in to write the accounts that um, God wants to communicate. And that means that if we're going to understand what God has to say, we have to understand the uh, genre that the authors he chose are using. And when it comes to inerrancy, there's a pretty simple argument you could make. The Bible says that Joshua annihilated everyone. Not everyone was annihilated. Therefore, the Bible is wrong. But remember, inerrancy accounts for this second point up here. We affirm that God in his work of inspiration utilized the distinctive personalities and literary styles of the writers whom he chose and prepared. So if we take a step back and remember the entire albright Wright synthesis was predicated on a misunderstanding of the genre. This is where I think it's important that that book, Lawson's book, came out about 30 years ago. It was written in 1990, and Albright, his whole uh, theories were you know, discussed in the 40s. So this is, relatively speaking, fairly contemporary research on, on, uh, on that particular front. So it's led a lot of maximalists, at least, to reevaluate where and it, the, the destruction of the Albright synthesis is not uh, the destruction of the biblical account. So this leads to the question then, what does the Bible actually say? So this is Kenneth Kitchen, who um, I think is probably one of the, one of the better representatives uh, um, of the maximalist approach. And basically this is his summary. So he says that the narratives of Joshua describe an entry into Canaan, a full destruction of two minor cities. Jericho and Ai that were burned. Uh, towns are attacked, they're taken, they're damaged, their kings are killed, the inhabitants are killed, but the cities are left alone. Um, and uh, the Israelites basically, they don't do this step-by-step uh, -step, uh, conquest of the land. Rather, there's a piece of land called Gilgal. They establish a base camp there. They do a strike on a city, they run back. They do a strike on another city, they run back. They do a strike on another city, and they run back. That's what's being communicated whenever you account for the conquest uh, uh, language and genre, and once you read in parallel the more sober analyses uh, that are placed right next to and in parallel to the more bombastic uh, conquest account. The uh, so that's the southern campaign. Uh, the Israelites go to Gilgal, they strike a couple of cities, they destroy two, Ai and Jericho. The northern campaign is the same thing, except only one city is actually destroyed, which is Hatzor. It's fully destroyed, and the Bible itself even says explicitly, and no other cities were burned but Hatzor only. So these preliminary successes were celebrated with war rhetoric appropriate to the time, which we call the uh, ancient conquest account, 
which should not be twisted to mean what it does not. So in summary, of all the 40 some odd sites that are listed in Jericho, only three are explicitly said to have been destroyed and Albright's overzealous interpretation demanded what, arche what the archeological record simply could not deliver on. So that I think in and of itself goes a long way in resolving a lot of the archeological debates over this, is simply saying, look, the text has been misread, Albright misinterpreted it, um, and so really when you start, if you look for this massive conquest, you're not gonna find it, but no one's claiming that that's what's happening anyway. Um, so that's what Joshua's account says. But let's look at outside of that, because the question of Israelite origins is not exclusively Exodus and conquest. So in uh, Exodus 23, God actually says, I will not drive them out from you in one year, or the land would become desolate and overrun by wild animals. Little by little, I will drive out the inhabitants of the land. This is repeated in parallel in Deuteronomy 7. The Lord your God will clear away these nations little by little, and you will not make a quick end of them. So this is what Kitchen means by the more sober analyses that are placed in parallel to the uh, war rhetoric. Um, the other point, too, that's in, uh, I know it says ju uh, judges, but one point that's also important in Joshua 24 is the promise that God gave, which is, I gave you land on which you had not labored, towns that you had not built, uh, and you live in them, and you eat fruits of vineyards that you did not plant. So if you're going to live in a town that you did not build, what's the point of burning it to the ground? It's just a trivial point that makes it, uh, um, uh, that makes the point that this was not a command to wipe out all these cities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We're we'll, we're actually getting to that point, but yeah, they could have used their pottery. Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't expect that, right? Now, another thing that's interesting is Judges one. So remember, Joshua happens, and then Judges is immediately following Joshua. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites inquire of the Lord, "Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them?" Which again suggests that Joshua didn't get the job done. But again, Joshua thirteen also says that anyway. The other thing, too, is that Judges is a very sad book, and in it says explicitly that the Israelites not only did not conquer the land, but they took their daughters as wives, or they took the daughters of the Canaanites as wives for themselves, their, um, and took their own daughters and gave it to their sons, gave them to their sons, and they worshiped their gods. So Judges says that basically within one generation, they're instantly assimilated into the Canaanite culture, which next week we'll discuss, is that good, is that bad, was that what God intended, yes, no, maybe, for our purpose, the archaeology that would be predicted from this is no break in material culture and no break in religious culture either. Um, and then some other miscellaneous accounts that are interesting. So Exodus uh, says that the crowd that left Egypt was a mixed multitude consisting of multiple different ethnicities, not Israelites only. Um, Ezekiel uh, chapter 16, which is a very uh, frightening chapter, amongst uh, its injunctions against the Hebrew people, Ezekiel says, your origin and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites, your father an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Even though this is taken to be as an insult, it does indicate some sort of indigenous relationship to the Canaanites uh, beyond just the conquest, uh, an invasive conquesting people. Uh, and then the last thing is we mentioned this last week about the creed that the Israelites would recite during the, first, uh, during the offering of the first fruits. And it starts off, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor, and he went down into Egypt. The Arameans, of course, were in Canaan, which more or less says my ancestor was an indigenous Canaanite. So these are other sort of um, scholarship calls these counter-narratives. I don't know if that's exactly the case. I like to call them uh, uh, supplementing voices. Essentially, you're not getting a single conquest narrative. You're getting multiple different pictures uh, of this complicated thing known as Israelite origins. So, in summary, the full accounting of the text is variegated. You have conquest narratives, you have Exodus narratives, you have assimilation narratives, um, you have indigenous narratives. And if you wanted to be selective and if you wanted to force the Bible to contradict something, you could legitimately cherry pick verses to argue that the fathers of the Hebrews were from Ur of the Chaldeans or they were from. Uh, or they were Arameans. You could selectively argue that the Israelites wiped out everyone in Canaan and settled it, or that they failed miserably uh, to take their inheritance. And you could argue that the uh, Israelites were commanded to annihilate the Cana uh, Canaanites, or you could argue that they were in fact indigenous Canaanites after all, depending on how selective you are with the texts. Now, um, 
my conclusion here, of course, is I don't think that's the right approach. We shouldn't be selective in the text and forcing it against itself and trying to create contradictions where there aren't any. But rather, um, and likewise, we shouldn't harmonize all the, dissent, the apparent dissension into one single smoothed out conquest narrative. Both of these approaches are wrong. Uh, but rather, what we need to do is let all of Scripture, all Scriptures breathed out by God, um, let it all speak uh, and let it uh, equally inform our understanding of the Israelite origins. I think even just from this comment, you can see that where we're going is not exactly the most traditional uh, approach to this question. So that's basically where we are with the biblical account. So the last thing to do then is to now uh, go to the rocks and see what's uh, been deposited there uh, and talk about some important archaeological considerations. Um, but before I do that, are there any uh, comments or questions or inputs or corrections even? Because I may have messed something up. Yes. What was the picture of the turtle for? Ah. <laughs> Little by little, right? Yes, little by little, slow and steady. That's, <laughs> That's all. what I thought. I didn't know if there's yeah, a reason there's an African tortoise. bird tortoise. I'm just quoting my, yeah. And so these, those two uh, things that the Lord said seems to be a little bit different from his uh, command mm -hmm. later, right? Yeah. I mean, the fact that he's going to do it little by little, but then telling them to... Yeah, th this is something that would take many years to sort out um, because the, the text is very underdeterminative. And if you're selective, you can definitely say, uh, maybe, you know, if you're selective, you can say that God was disappointed with the Israelites. Maybe this was a prophecy of the Israelites. Maybe he used their rebellion, you know, to, to fulfill this. I don't, I don't know. The, the, the point being that, you know, you, it's, it's a multiple, um, it's not a single like coherent, or it's not, it is coherent, it just takes a lot of effort to put all the pieces together, uh, but it's not just like one simplified, homogenous uh, picture of Israelite origins. So where you, oh sorry, there's one. Um, no, go ahead. So where you just left off, you're talking about how we don't want to like try and pick and choose both the scripture as a whole. Is that something that we'll be picking up on again in the next, like the week after next, or are we going to come back to like at the end of well, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that this is something that we try to do uh, uh, for just about, for, for about every topic. Um, and this, this is especially true for the, um, uh, when, when we try to understand the theology behind these texts. Because if we just take all of the annihilation texts and put them in a basket, and first of all, rip them out of their context um, and put them in a basket and then put them next to the Sermon on the Mount, that looks weird, right? Um, destroy everything in the land, leave nothing alive that breathes, next to uh, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, and that's something that is, is frankly a very difficult question. Um, and I think that what we've actually already done is laid the groundwork for that in, in that these ancient conquest narratives, or sorry, the ancient conquest genre already starts to put a different perspective on what these are um, and, so, and starts to reduce that tension. But you're right, there are some people in fact, let me, ah, I said I wouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. There are some people who would just rather not look at the Old Testament. The classic example in, uh, is a, a heretic named Marcion, long, uh, I want to say about 200 AD or so. Uh, Marcion's approach was, you know, this Old Testament is weird, it's spooky, it's hard to understand. Jesus is a lot less spooky and a lot easier to understand. Why don't we just cut them in twain and let the Old Testament float away? So a lot of people will suggest, in fact, we'll even get into this in two weeks, that if you try to elevate Jesus to the point where you get rid of the Old Testament, you get the term Marcionite thrown onto you. Um, I think the more charitable approach is just um, lazy, like you're not actually reading the Old Testament. Uh, I would rather call someone lazy than a Marcionite, frankly. Um, but in any event, I, I think you're exactly right. We, we have to let all of Scripture, all of Scripture is breathed out by God, we have to let it speak. Go, uh, sure, Sam. You said that you uh, that based on a selective reading of the text, you can say that the Israelite ancestors were Ar uh, Armen sorry, Arameans, Arameans, or from the land or Chaldeans from the land mm -hmm. of Ur. Um, so, how does a uh, synthetic reading of the text, my word, not yours, yeah, uh, how, how, square how those, those together? So I. This was a particular one I have not actually looked into, but I think the um, this is actually 
you asked a great question during the Adam and Eve one about why is Adam given all the attention and not uh, hypothetically, if you had an ancestor, wouldn't his ancestor be an, an ancestor of us all the same way Adam is? Interestingly, um, there are times in the scripture where the focus on the ancestry changes depending on the time period and who is, for lack of a better term, theologically interesting. Uh, in Genesis 11, it is actually Abraham's father that is listed as the father of the Hebrews, which is why I brought up that example. Because at the time that that was written, he was the most theologically interesting. When it comes to uh, the Exodus narratives, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for example, for Moses, because those are the theologically interesting people. Now, um, when it comes to this confession in Deuteronomy, I actually do not know what they're talking about there, and, but my hunch would be that the Aramean was my father might actually be referencing either somebody who was older than Abraham, so it could be like a really old tradition who did come from, uh, 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 who was an Aramean, or it could come from um, maybe Jacob or something like that. I actually don't know on that on that front. If anybody in the chat is has studied this, or if anybody here has something, please contribute. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So if you if you take take into account the um, ancient Near East, ancient conquest, you know, type of language and everything, but in, can you still kind of make distinctions of their conquest? compared to other ancient Near East conquests? Because I think that some of the time they didn't loot and they didn't do things like that. And did they enslave? Oof. I can't remember. But I mean, you know, that you said the other guy, the other account was mm -hmm. that they, you know, they, they, yeah. they conquered and then they enslaved her. But, but I know that on one of the, um, the burnings of the city, they didn't take mm -hmm. anything. Right. Well, um, th that's, a, that's a great point. We'll, we'll get to that in, in a second. So the, um, that is also rolled into sort of the theology and the purpose of, of the conquests uh, in general. Um, but on that, that has more to do, that has, I think that, personally, I think that has less to do with the conquest accounts themselves and more to do with like the rules that were, the rules of engagement. Um, and whew, the rules of engagement for warfare are not pleasant reading because it regulates who you can and can't take as a slave, who you can and can't uh, take as a prisoner, who you can and can't slaughter, what you can and can't eat. Um, it is weird, it is difficult, and uh, we judiciously left it out of this meeting and this semester, actually. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the, the best. They did have rules. Of, you know, they they did, rules. Yeah. The Israelites then had. Uh, somehow funky rules that God said they could not couldn't do. Right. The one classic example of that, uh, at least in Deuteronomy, is uh, that there was a limitation, and th this sounds so terrible in the 21st century, there was a limitation on the women that you could take. If you took a woman from, okay, so you just invaded a city, you've killed her husband and her family, or actually, no, if she's a virgin woman, um, you could take her. So you've killed her dad. Um, you can take her into your home. But you have to wait a full 30 days for her to mourn her family. You have to wait for her to acclimate to your society. Um, you cannot, and, and only after those 30 days will, can you actually marry her. And then after marrying her, can you then actually have sexual intercourse with her? Which is obviously horrifying by today's standards. But if you look at it from the lens of the alternative was uh, killing her instantly or even raping her, as was the standard at that time, then that definitely is a regulation at minimum in the right direction. A massive, massive can of worms that we will leave closed. So, all right, let's move on to the archaeology. So as a quick summary of what we just said, depending on how selective you are with the text, you can make a thousand arguments about where the Israelites came from. Um, and uh, the best thing to do is to let all of it speak and then use archaeology as a control to sort of inform the material questions that are relevant here. So let's look at some archaeology. Um, Quick review from last week, we talked about how in Egypt there are a lot of archaeological concerns about interpreting this. Archaeology is not a perfect hard science, it is open to interpretation. As a hard scientist, I can tell you even hard science is open to interpretation. Um, but it's even more difficult because archaeology is a highly contingent science. In other words, it's very difficult to do an archaeological experiment. 
um, it's almost exclusively contingent on historical things that happen to play out a certain way so that things from the past happen to be preserved. A classic example of this was the Dead Sea Scrolls that we talked about. The reason that those papyrus uh, fragments were preserved was because they happened to be stored in a very dry, arid region. Whereas in the uh, Nile Delta, that's a giant marshland. And it's estimated that upwards of 99% of the new of, uh, papyri that was generated during the New Kingdom period has been lost forever, just because of uh, environmental conditions. Um, and also there's no natural source of stone there either. So most of the buildings, unless they were super fancy government buildings, they were built out of mud. So that was the Nile, but whenever we get uh, past uh, the Transjordan and into the Negev and on into Judea and Palestine, we're still not done because we have some additional uh, concerns there. Now, um, I'm going to butcher this completely because I'm not an archaeologist at all, but um, I will do my best. This is an image of what's called a tell, which is essentially an artificial mound of dirt. Uh, and long story short, there are layers um, that th this is a, these are generated whenever cities are built on top of each other. So you build a city, then it's either destroyed or it's abandoned, and then later other people come in, they relay a foundation, they build on it again. Sometimes uh, walls are reused and things of that nature. But after a long, long, long period of time, um, you can find this mound of dirt, and you dig into it, and you have this nice layer, a nice series of layer or uh, layers of strata. And these are called tells, which is just mound. So at the very top layer, of course, that's the most recent city. Uh, the deeper you go, the older you, uh, the older you get. So whenever we talk about archaeology of cities, we're talking about these tells. Now, on this picture, I, I don't see any label that says this is the city of Jericho or this is the city of such and such. And if you recall from our discussion about the Exodus dating, uh, names get updated all the time. Um, in fact, I heard a great example, which is that Houston, uh, Texas, was originally called Harrisburg. Now, if you were talking about something that happened 200 years ago while it was called Harrisburg, would you tell your audience, so while so-and-so was traveling through Harrisburg, no, of course not. You would say while they were traveling through Houston. We all know where Houston is. So this happens all the time. And one of the biggest archaeological or biggest problems in archaeology is trying to find a tell that has no identifying letters on it, no welcome to Jericho or anything on there, and trying to identify that with an actual city from the Bible that may or may not still uh, have the same name. So that is an enormously difficult problem. Some additional things is erosion. So one thing is, if this tell is abandoned and for 400, 500, 1,000 years, weather doesn't stop. And there's no like parks and recreation upkeep program that keeps all the archaeology, archaeological data intact. So there's no telling how much weathering can just wash away literally centuries and centuries of evidence uh, further down, uh, the further down you go. The other thing, too, is looking at this tell, you would think that all tells are excavated from the very top layer to the very bottom layer. That is not even close to accurate. Of the tells that are, quote unquote, extensively excavated, those only consist of maybe 5% of the entire data that's available. Um, sometimes you might get 50%, but the overwhelming majority of archaeology barely gets past 5% excavation. There are interesting reasons for this. Partially, the, the fact that uh, all the most interesting things, interesting tells from the past, are in a piece of land where everyone is trying to kill each other with rocket launchers about 24 hours a day. So if you're trying to excavate a region while you're constantly getting attacked and bombarded and there's no telling what country is in control of the land that you're on, it's really difficult to excavate more than 5%. I'm sure you know Indiana Jones is an excellent example of this and following the collapse of the Nazis, things have not gotten more stable. So you know, say what you will about that. Um, and then last thing, this is more relevant, is that the expected evidence of a particular event it's almost impossible to actually predict what evidence should be present for a particular event. We talk about the conquest. It's the, 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 the arguments over the conquest followed the same basic format. If the conquest happened, we should have XYZ evidence. We do not have XYZ evidence, therefore the conquest didn't happen. I don't want to get into the details for the sake of time, but most of these arguments fail whenever compared to known conquests. I point you to this paper by Isleron uh, in 1983 where he goes through extensive detail on three known conquests. The Norman Conquest, 
1066, the Anglo-Saxon settlement in England, and the Muslim Arab conquest of the Levant. All of these are nobody, nobody in their right mind questions their uh, reality. But Israelin says that the evidence that they leave behind, if you didn't already believe in them, you wouldn't believe in them. Now, I'd leave you to uh, read that paper. It's kind of weird. I don't understand it all. But um, I think it's an interesting point that, uh, just to say that our a priori armchair archaeology isn't always correct. So um, once we get into this particular question of the conquest, last week we talked about the date of the exodus. And I basically said, nobody cares. It's not a big deal. Stop worrying about it. Now we have to worry about it. Because depending on what layer you're talking about, let me go back to my tell real quick. These layers correspond to different years. So if you say, oh, the conquest happened in 1406 BC, uh, and you dig a city to the 1406 BC layer, and there's nothing there, that's going to be relevant. If, however, you say, oh, the uh, conquest happened in 1207 BC, and you dig to the 1207 layer, then that evidence is going to be relevant. In fact, the overwhelming majority of arguments about the conquest, the standard response from any person, it doesn't matter what date they adhere to, they just say, oh, you're looking at the wrong layer. Almost every time. It's the, it's the most convenient answer. If you don't like the evidence from a particular layer, just change the date. Just switch yourself to another date. And boom, now you have avoided all conquest. Or sorry, avoided all uh, 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 controversy. So as a quick reminder, we talked about five biblical approaches to answering the question of when was the exodus. And as a quick reminder, the exodus happened 40 years afterwards, the conquest happened. So that's we're talking about these dates plus 40. These are the five dates that we got from the Bible. Here are even more dates that are suggested from the Bible and other uh, sources of data. Spans over a thousand years, well, close to a thousand years. So our standard solutions are the 1270 late date and the 1446 early date. Um, I'll spare you the details, but I'll go really quick just as a quick reminder. 1270 uh, comes from dating the Exodus to um, dating the cities of Exodus 111 of Pithom and Ramses connecting that to uh, Pi Ramesses, which is Ramses II, which is uh, 1279, is when he started to reign. So that's where the late date comes from. The early date comes from 1 Kings 6 1, where it says 480 years after the Exodus, Solomon began construction on the temple. Solomon is dated to 966, 966 plus 480, 1446. Of course, there's also a Septuagint version, but nobody cares about the Septuagint. So we're going to uh, talk about the late and early dates, so keep these numbers in your head. So now we're actually going to get into the archaeological data. Um, as a quick reminder, our fancy word for this is terminus antiquem, which is the merneptastela. So any data that we have for Israel is going to have to be before 1200 BC, because that's when we know that Israel existed and Israel encountered um, uh, Egyptian forces. So all the data we analyze has to be before 1200 BC. Now, you remember the three main uh, cities that we talked about, Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor. These are the three cities that were claimed to be destroyed, so these are the three most important cities. There are many, 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 many more cities and many more archaeological pieces of data, but these are the three most important and the ones that are debated uh, the most. Um, every archaeologist will tell you that their city that they're ex excavating, if the conquest didn't happen at this city, then it didn't happen at all. I read, I'm not kidding, I have read this about Jericho, I've read it about Gideon, I've read it about Hatsor, I've read it about AI, and it seems to correlate pretty tightly to whoever's project is being funded. So I don't know what to tell you about that. But in any event, if these three cities don't have destruction layers, that's going to be the, probably the most significant problem. So let's talk about Jericho real quick. Um, so Jericho is located at Tel Es Sultan. This is not controversial. Nobody debates the location at all. This is what it looks like from the air uh, in this image here. You can kind of see the rough outline. This image here, I don't know if you can really see it that well, but basically uh, this is a, what is this? Sagittal uh, cut of the city. Cross sure. Cross section, that's the word. Okay, this is a cross section. Um, and you can see this is the lower wall right here, uh, and then this is the upper wall, and this, um, this is what was uh, dated to the Middle Bronze Age, which is like the 1500s, uh, uh, 1600s BC. Uh, and this is close to what's described in the biblical text, that it's a well-fortified city. 
So the first serious excavation of Tel El Sultan was by this guy named Watzinger and his friend Selin in 1913, and that's where they found this massive wall. The wall had residences in them. So now things should be clicking in your head. Oh, yeah, Rahab, didn't she live in the wall? Ah, this sounds good. So John Garstang is another archaeologist. He came along about 15 years later, and he followed the previous walls that uh, Watzinger and Selin had discovered. Um, and upon inspection, he found that they, uh, he found additional destruction to these walls due to collapse. Ah, person lives in the wall, walls collapse. This sounds like it's all at Jericho. It's all coming together now. And uh, he noticed that there were burned and charred remains. In particular, there was charred grain because the Israelite, and this is important because the Israelites were told not to take any food, whereas the Egyptians, if they had destroyed the city, they probably would have starved the people out. So the fact that there was grain and the fact that it was burned, that's looking really good. Uh, city 4 is just the particular location that he was in. Found these collapsed walls, and they were collapsed outwardly. And wouldn't you know it, it's all dated to 1406 B.C., exactly 40 years after the Exodus. This is exciting, right? But as has been the theme... I have to be the wet blanket and say, if this, was, if, if this was uncontroversially true all the way down, this would be really exciting. So sadly, sadly for us, but honestly for us, um, Garsting's dating, so this is important, and this is what the debate comes down to. So he primarily bases dating on what's called uh, bichrome pottery. It's a type of pottery that just has two different colors on it. Again, all archaeological debates ultimately come down to pottery. It's very annoying. It's the number one reason I will never be an archaeologist. <laughs> there are other reasons, but in any event. So the, but this pottery dates to 1400 or so BC. Well, there's a lady named Kathleen Kenyon, who was a, uh, a very well-established uh, uh, archaeologist from the United Kingdom. And she came along and said, you know, I don't think Garstang got this right. I think he is so... Uh, he's... he's sort of myopic and looking at everything through the biblical text. And so she said, I'm going to look at this using my new method. So she developed an archaeological method called the Cath or sorry, the uh, Kenyon Wheeler method. And I could not tell you anything past that. Uh, I don't know how it works exactly. But she says, I'm going to try this new method, and I'm going to look at this without, quote, any biblical baggage. Um, so she's not going to defer to the text. And basically, her new method dated the destruction at City 4 to about 1550 BC, which is a full 150 years prior to the Israelites' ostensible, uh, uh, arrival, in, ostensible arrival into uh, Canaan. And then later, uh, carbon-14 dating on this particular destruction layer put it at about 1573 BC, plus or minus 50. Um, and so now, and that of course lines up perfectly with her date of uh, 1550. So this was, and this right here was basically it for most, um, uh, for most archaeological scholars or anybody who's like kind of interested in Old Testament studies. This is about as far as anybody really gets on Jericho. Um, they say, "Oh, Kathleen Kenyon debunked the Bible, you know, a long time ago." Um, but obviously, there are still people that are early daters that still defend this today. You also notice, by the way, that. None of these dates are remotely close to our 1270 late date. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and so the response has been that the early daters argue first that Kenyon's arguments uh, are contingent on her particular region of the city. She was in a different region than Garstang was, and so she didn't find this pottery, and that's why she thought it was older. Garstang did find the pottery, and that's why he thought that it was younger. And so her arguments actually just ignore the pottery altogether. They don't explain it, they don't account for it, they just ignore it, and that's a problem. Um, Again, it always comes down to the pottery. It's so annoying. And then the other debate that they have is over carbon-14 dating. And they say, oh, well, you know, like at 1400 BC, like, you know, the sun gets in our eyes and, you know, we can't quite read the carbon-14 all the same, so anything past 1400, you can't trust carbon-14. Um, now, there are debates over whether this is legitimate. Personally, I don't find it persuasive. I think carbon-14 is perfectly fine. But uh, the... Basically, they say that there's some type of like carbon contamination at 1400 BC, and so because of that, we need a 200-year shift for any carbon dating past 1400 BC. So wouldn't you know it, if you include the pottery, and if you do the carbon-14 dating just right, uh, it actually lines up with Garstang's original argument. So 
What do you all think on that? Yes? Just an overall question. It seems that I'm not used to the social sciences, so this could be completely wrong. The what science? The social sciences, so I could be completely wrong. But from what I do know, it doesn't seem that the social sciences typically work between, you know, like one to two percent error, and sometimes there's like you know, 15 to 20 percent. I'm looking at that range of dates, and I'm like, those uh -huh. are, you know, 10 to 20 percent error, which seems generally fine for like, but. You're, you're talking about 1550 and 1406? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So again, this gets down to the this gets down to the detail. So so archaeology is it's a social science, but it's based on like real science, um, and it comes down to the pottery. Why do you keep making? Why do you, I don't want to talk about pottery, but for whatever reason, the particular methods of pottery manufacturing are dependent on certain technologies that are available at the time. Consider the fact that we date human history by metals, Bronze Age, Iron Age, etc. You can do the same thing with pottery. I am told, I refuse to read the papers. I do not want to look at any more pottery. So uh, allegedly, so I, actually I should reference uh, names here. So Bryant Wood, so I, I know I sound a little dismissive about the carbon-14 thing, but I mean, there, there are serious, I mean, there are serious uh, debates about it. So Bryant Wood and, uh, is like the main scholar who is really pushing this. He's a nice guy, evangelical archeologist, early dater and all that. Um, and he is the one that has really been Let's be honest, evangelicals are the only people that really care about this debate over Jericho. For most of secular scholarship, they've moved on and looked at other stuff. So Bryant Wood is still pushing this forward, and he's the one that basically has made these two arguments. He says Kenyon's pottery arguments are bad, and the carbon-14 shift uh, needs to occur. Um, interested? They don't care? Not that I know of, uh, but that could just be more of me not reading more than I should, so. <laughs> Um, but to answer your question, yeah, so the, the, the pottery is dependent on a certain method that was only available like in 1450. Um, so a 1550 pushes it past that threshold. So that's where that date comes from. Okay. Any other comments on this? I think Sam had a... Uh, yeah, I had a few questions about pottery. Okay. <laughs> uh, no but more the pottery. interesting thing is they don't just let it... They don't... They don't say, okay, well, all everything is settled. Mm -hmm. they, to my knowledge, if they can, they're still there looking and doing all this pottery looking. In, in, at Jericho? Yeah. yeah there, so the other thing with archaeology is that excavations, uh, they're done in short bursts, and then they take a really long time to analyze. The most recent one in Jericho was in the 1990s. Uh, and from what I read, nothing changed this general debate over that. Okay. Now, for those of you that are early daters, uh, this is where the debate is. It's over the pottery and the carbon-14. So if, uh, if Bryant Wood, and also I put Ted Wright on here, he's actually a good popularizer on all of this. I mean, he actually is an archeologist, but he, uh, um, he sort of takes the scholar stuff and put it in public, uh, easier to understand terms. Um, so if Bryant, or sorry, if Wood's arguments are correct, if he's able to get the pottery thing, and if he's able to get the carbon-14 thing, then Jericho would be, solidly an early date victory on that point. But for those of you that are late daters, uh, none of this is relevant because you're still a hundred and some odd years off, almost 200 years off. So for the late date, this is basically what they point out. So the first thing is that there was in fact a smaller reoccupation of Jericho after this initial destruction. So I should point out, there's no debate. There was, actual, ac there was, there was an actual destruction that happened sometime between 1400 and 1600 BC. Um, but after that, in the 13th century, there was a smaller reoccupation uh, of Jericho, and there were possibly walls that were put up into place. But immediately after the destruction of this uh, smaller occupation, there was a 400-year occupation gap to which the erosion, weathering effects, and just human beings walking by basically have destroyed any possibility of discovering anything about Jericho from the 13th century. So to summarize, so and, and this is actually the consensus position of even secular scholars. So uh, this is uh, um, uh, Amahi Masar, I think is how that name is pronounced. Um, and basically, th this is like a standard textbook. This is a textbook here at A&M, actually. And he says basically that um, there was a settlement during the late Bronze Age, late 13th century, though most of its remains were eroded and removed by human activity. 
So because of this, in the case of Jericho, the archaeological data cannot serve as a decisive evidence to deny a historical nucleus in the book of Joshua. So here, he's just assuming the late date uh, uh, conquest. And basically just says, look, it's a wash. There's, there's no way one way or the other you can argue this. Uh, Kitchen, he takes the late date, so he says the same thing. For this simple reason, or he says 200 years of erosion suffice to remove most of the later Bronze Age Jericho, and it's a miracle that 400 years, that's the time from about 1275 to uh, 900 BC, uh, 400 years of erosion, um, it, it's a miracle anything survived from it. And for that very reason, given the late date, we will never find Joshua's Jericho. So pretty convenient, isn't it? <laughs> There's no way you can prove it wrong. It's a complete draw. Um, so that's basically what it comes down to. Early daters fight about pottery and carbon-14. Late daters say, eh, you can't disprove it. You can't prove it either. Not enough evidence. No fingerprints, nothing. You can't do anything. So what do we do with Jericho? It's a wash. I think it's a wash archaeologically. It depends on your view of the text at that point. That's what's going to guide how you interpret the data. Okay? Now, the second city is uh, AI. Now, this one I'm going to buzz through pretty quickly for the sake of time. The location here is at Tell, maybe. Maybe et tel. So et tel is a particular tel. And the excavation showed this place was completely unoccupied for 1,200 years. 24 BC, 2400 BC all the way up to 1200 B, uh, 1220 BC. No occupation whatsoever. So it doesn't matter what date you take. There's nobody there to destroy. Um, so there are three basic responses to this. Uh, the first one is to point out that the name Ai comes from the Hebrew ha'ai, which means something like ruin. It basically means like a wasted city. And so the non-historical approach to this is to say, oh, well, this isn't actually a historical story. This is what's called an etiological story. The Israelites were walking around, and they noticed this pile, you know, this completely dilapidated city. One of the kids asked, hey, where did that come from? Well, you remember Joshua, right? Well, let me tell you a story about Joshua. And that's basically how it got started. One thing led to another. It ended up in the book of Joshua. So that's the non-historical approach. The early daters who think this is historical, so Bryant Wood again, oh, sorry, Bryant, I mis, uh, typed that wrong. He actually argues, wait a minute, how are we even sure that this particular location is even the right location? Uh, because it seems like these people are playing fast and loose with the biblical text. They take just enough of the data in the biblical text to say this is where AI is located, but then they ignore all the other things when it contradicts. So he actually argues that there are 12 descriptors of the biblical AI, and Etel only meets like five of them. So he's argued for another location, which is Kerbet el Makater, um, and he says this is the biblical AI. And wouldn't you know it, it has a destruction layer at 1400 BC. Um, I should point out that he only considers sites that have destruction layers at 1400 BC as potential candidates for the biblical AI. So is that possibly circular, I, anchoring in a sense? I, I don't know. Um, but it is, I mean, it, it's a question. Do you, do you say that AI are only places that can have a destruction layer at 1400 BC? Or do you say that this is AI and it doesn't have a destruction layer at 1400 BC? It's hard to say. But again, destruction layer 1400 BC, if you're a late dater, that's not going to do you any good. So what do late daters say? They're, they also agree with Bryant Wood that the location is probably wrong, um, or it could be wrong. Now, another interesting argument, which is the approach that Kitchen takes, is he actually says that the story about AI is the story about the conquest of Bethel instead. And he points out in Joshua 8 that um, the, I, I should actually relay a little bit of the story. What Joshua does here is he splits his, spot, his fighting force in, into two. He goes on the opposite side of AI and assembles a small strike force with him, waves his spear around and says, hey, come get me. All the men uh, in AI rush out, then they leave the gates wide open, and they chase after Joshua and his small force. Then a second force sneaks in through the gates of AI and wipes out the city and burns it to the ground. Um, and then they join up with the other fighting force, and they wipe out the rest of the men from AI. But Kitchen points out that Joshua 8 says, there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. And so Kitchen says, wait, 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 wait. why is Bethel included in this? And he actually suggests that 
the story about AI, uh, AI was just this small, like literally just a small little uh, outpost that was actually a subsidiary of Bethel. And so these stories just became conflated, and because it's uh, funnier if AI is the main city, that's basically more or less how the editors chose to do it. And Bethel does have a destruction layer in the 1300, or in the 13th century. So what do we do with AI? Again, nobody knows what to do with this. You have suggestions all over the map. So comments on AI? No? Okay, so our last city is Hotsor. Finally, we're gonna get something good, right? So we've got two really bizarre all over the place. Hotsor is a little bit different. So again, this is at Tel El Qaeda, um, and it was excavated in the 50s and 60s, and it's actually their current uh, excavations going on now. Now, Hotsor uh, has three destruction layers in it. This is from the Northern Campaign, remember? Um, there's one in, at about 1550, there's another one attributed to Seti I around 1300, and then there is a final destruction of the city from which it never recovered um, at around uh, 1200 BC, slightly before 1200 BC. So um, of these, of course, the 1200 BC is the most interesting one because we have these uh, brick walls that were turned orange from the heat of the fire that was uh, um, lit on this city. Uniquely, this is the important part, Hatsor was a cultic center. There were a lot of temples and religious icons. And the cultic objects that were present were desecrated and destroyed, which was unlike anything seen uh, previously in the archaeological record. So I actually have an example right here behind me. This is um, a statue at one of the spots, and you can see that it's been decapitated. So that's its head right there, body right there, and you look, that is clearly an intentional decapitation. The hands also of statues were removed as well. Um, and this is something that nobody in Canaan did except the Israelites because, as we'll talk about several weeks from now, most of the Canaanites didn't do this out of superstition, or actually not even superstition. They thought that the gods of the temples were real. So even when they invaded these other cities, they left the religious icons alone, lest divine retribution come to them. But clearly, whoever sacked uh, Hatsor didn't care about that. And interestingly, this lines up very tightly with the, assess, uh, with the order in Deuteronomy 7. This is how you must deal with them. Break down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their sacred poles, burn their idols with fire. So this type of destruction of cultic objects was commanded by the Israelites, or commanded of them, and is exhibited at Hatzor. So because of that, the uh, previous excavator, Yadin, and uh, his successor, Ben Tor, both of them concur, in fact, the consensus is that this is, in fact, direct evidence of the Israelites active because no other military force does this kind of goofy stuff. But you'll notice this is in 1200 BC. So the late daters in the room are probably smirking, thinking, ah, got you there. So what do the early daters do? Honestly, I don't know. I did not get to that point um, before starting this. So I think, so I'm gonna speculate here, I think the early daters pick one of these earlier uh, uh, destruction layers, because again, there are, I just listed three significant ones. There are actually more than that. This place was destroyed several times. But none of the destruction layers have this intentional cultic destruction uh, that's going on. So even the other ones are probably not working out uh, so well. Um, again, you'd have to read a, uh, an early dater. I, try, I really tried to get it in here, but I ran out of time, uh, unfortunately. So, so Bryant Wood is the main guy, um, and Ted Wright is another guy who's like a good popularizer of these things. Um, he's got like a YouTube channel or something. So I'd recommend uh, both of those guys. So what is our scorecard? All right, for the late daters, Jericho. Well, our 13th century Jericho doesn't exist anymore, so you can't tell us one way or the other. AI, it could be uh, this location, the consensus location, and it could be linked to Bethel. And Hotsor, come on, Hotsor is a slam dunk. It lines up perfectly, the destruction layers are the same, the date's right, it's perfect, it fits excellently. So, mixed results, but Hotsor definitely is good on the late date side. Let's look at the early date side. Well, look, we've got a giant issue with Jericho. We have, a we have the walls falling down, we have burned grain, we have pottery that lines up perfectly, it's just Kathleen Kenyon getting in the way of things, and she's wrong anyway. So all we have to do is adjust 
the carbon-14 thing, and we've got a really good argument on our side. Now, I have to agree. I think that Jericho definitely points in the direction of an early date. AI, uh, it could be uh, Kerbet El, uh, sorry, Kerbet El Makater, or it could be somewhere else entirely. It's a complete open question. Uh, with Hotsore, again, I, don't, I personally don't know um, on that, but my guess is that we have a lot of destruction layers to choose from. It doesn't have to be this last one. Although that one fits nicely, it doesn't have to be that one. So kind of fudge the data a bit on Hotsore. So if I took a poll in the room, I'm actually curious. I'm wondering if I should do this. So show, show of hands. Yeah, room game, yeah. Show of hands. Who would say that they are more convinced by the early date? A couple of folks, okay. How many of you think the late date wins out? How many of you have no idea? Oh, okay, nobody, nobody wins, okay. I am very strongly biased in one direction. I wonder if y'all can figure out which direction it is. Huh, early date? Hmm. No, maybe? Okay, late date? No, not the late date. I'm a centrist, so I accept the exact middle date. It's the only way to be true, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I accept all dates, all the same. Yes, exactly, yes. They all contribute something to the conversation. Okay, so... <laughs> yeah. All right, so any, any comment on that very tedious uh, uh, excursus on archaeology? We got an early date in the chat. All right. So that is two early dates, I think one late date, and... Several I don't care or I don't know. What was the what? What was the pottery? Oh, <laughs> the pottery again. Okay, so let's bring this all together real quick. All right, so quick summary of all. So we talked about a lot of biblical verses. We talked a lot about archaeology. What, what does this look like all together? So the biblical data, again, Joshua's military campaigns are related via the ancient conquest account genre that includes hyperbole, hyperbole, annihilation language, and many other features that mitigate against a strictly literal reading. Once we uh, um, calibrate for that genre and then also read in parallel the more sober military accounts, we find that only Jericho, AI, and Hotsor are ex burned and destroyed. So those are the most significant uh, destruction layers. The full range of data across Joshua, Judges, Exodus, Deuteronomy, even the prophets, paints a variegated portrait of Israelite origins. It includes both a violent, as we've been focused on right now, and nonviolent entry into the land, such as Judges. The archaeological data says that the three key sites, all, all three key sites, have destruction layers. No matter what, what or how you look at it, they all have destruction layers. But they present a mixed picture. Uh, regarding the date of those destruction layers, as well as you know the geography of where they're located, it, it, it's a mixed picture. Um, and then lastly, there's not a clear break in material culture between indigenous Canaanites and the indisputably Israelite time period. There's, it's not like we have a hard break shift in pottery or a hard break shift in uh, architecture or anything like that. We just kind of have this gradual change over time. So. How do we do this? So if you remember at the very beginning, I talked about the three different models that were suggested. So the first one is the conquest model. This is the Albright model that we've kind of been dunking on for a while. The second one is the peaceful infiltration model. Um, and this is the one that says, you know, the Israelites kind of were wandering around in the Transjordan, and then they just sort of showed up into Canaan and started preaching their message of Yahweh and love, and everyone got on board. Um, and it's important to point out that there is textual evidence for this. So the mixed multitude of Exodus 12 is potentially uh, you know, an evidence for that. The Midianites that convert and follow are evidence of this. The Kenites and the Gibeonites as well make uh, treaties with uh, the Israelites and become incorporated in their um, uh, society. The last one is what's called resettled pastoral Canaanites. So basically, this is actually the view of a guy named Israel Finkelstein. I think this is probably the most popular one uh, today. Basically, all this says is uh, towards the end of the Bronze Age and at the beginning of the Iron Age, there was a massive uh, political instability throughout the entirety of Canaan. Uh, the Egyptian hegemony had collapsed, so there was no protection. Um, everyone was competing and fighting against each other. What do you do in a situation like that? You move out to the hills. So basically, uh, the Bronze Age collapse led to people moving out into the hills, just living on their own. And then 
uh, throughout the beginning of the Iron Age, they come back into the land and resettle where they originally had been. And that the Israelites basically emerged during that process. Um, and then the last one, I really think this one's kind of dumb, but and most people do too, it's called the Peasant Revolt. Uh, it was, there what? That would make sense if we were talking about 1300 AD. <laughs> yes. We'd have a peasant revolt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sort of yeah, your, your feudalism. So, yeah, th this view, okay, so I was reading a, a review of it, which I, I'll actually tell you what the review is in a second here. The reviews have been, this was created by a bunch of Marxists that did not know what they were talking about. And, and it's, they were admittedly Marxist and, and through and through. Like they said, this is our Marxist interpretation of it. So nobody cares about this one. Um, but the, and the other two are, are reasonable. So this fellow named Richard Hess, he wrote the quintessential article summarizing this uh, called Early Israel and Canaan, A Survey of Recent Evidence and Interpretations. And this is his conclusion. The evidence suggests that the biblical evidence, sorry, the biblical evidence does not perfectly coincide with any of the models proposed. Not a pure conquest, not a pure peaceful infiltration or the resettlement theory either. In and of itself, this neither proves nor disproves the accounts, and the biblical material serves purposes other than those with which modern, uh, the modern historian may seek. So again, he's saying these are not answering the questions that we personally may be interested in in the late 20th century. So thus, to accept all the models is not to opt for a simple middle-of-the-road position, some sort of centrist uh, gobbledygook, but rather to affirm the diversity of human motivations and social action involved in the process of becoming a people. Israel's appearance and or reappearance in the 13th century may have led to the establishment of a religious faith which brought together other tribal groups and so led to the formation of the people of Israel in Canaan. And I think he, he is correct in this. We find textual and archaeological evidence that fit with a, a people that came into Canaan they had some military skirmishes at Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor, and many other cities as well. They also welcomed in people that were willing to be loyal to Yahweh. Rahab, of course, is the quintessential example of this. Her family says, we have heard what the Lord did to the Egyptians, and our hearts melted, so please don't kill us. Can I join your uh, uh, clan? Um, and the archaeologi archaeological evidence suggests that uh, other clans may have done that as well. And so in his summary, I'm not going to read all this, but he summarizes aspects of uh, the Bible that are not disproven by the evidence and aspects of these theories that are not disproven by the evidence. Um, and basically, he inscribes a big giant circle that says, this is the realm of evidential possibility, and you can mix and match the pieces any way that you want. Um, you can uh, read that if you want. So what are our takeaways here from last week and this week? So uh, like I already said about the Exodus, this is a very central historical event. Um, we have good a priori reason for accepting it more or less at face value, at least the broad outlines, and that uh, the broad archaeological evidence that is available corroborates largely to the story. Now, what about the conquest stories? Well, first, we have to realize, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the Bible gives a variegated portrait of the origin of Israel. And so responsible interpreters should not minimize these, what may be dissenting voices, to your theory. Secondly, the archaeological data, honestly, is quite mixed but each show elements concomitant with the various factors at play in the biblical text. So the peaceful infiltration, the military conquest, and things of that nature. Next, like, like I mentioned, various theories, I just suggested four, have been suggested, but none of them are comprehensive, and so you have to bring in elements of each one of them. A complicated origin story requires a complicated theory. So in sum, an exodus from Egypt followed by military skirmishes related by uh, ancient conquest accounts is what we have and then followed by additional Canaanite factions that aligned with Israel, and as we saw, Israel aligned with Canaanite factions as well um, to produce ultimately a mixed population. So uh, that is all that I have. So are there any comments or questions on this? I had a comment about the pottery part. <laughs> so we had a comment in the Zoom. We did. Wait. I don't see a comment. It was a verbal comment, I believe. Oh, I don't have my headphones in. I'm so sorry. I don't even have them with me. Uh, I dropped the ball. Here. Um... It sounds like it's being typed. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I totally dropped the ball. Here. If all else fails, Andrew could review it. Mm -hmm.
I'm the only one who can hear it. <laughs> so he could also repeat, he could also just say his own question yeah. as their question. I hear furious typing. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that all of you can see the um, complication here with, <laughs> with this very. It's a pottery question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. So the comment is, the Cypriot pottery was imported from Cyprus, which is why it's used to date the conquest to the 15th century. Okay, so, yeah, which is the 1400s, yeah. So the, the yeah, that, that's right. So the, um, those trade routes, uh, presumably, again, I'm not familiar. This is from Jeshua, um, who can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this. But if I remember correctly, the trade routes from Cyprus were not established until uh, into the 1400s, which is why 1550 pushes past that threshold. I could be wrong on that. Uh, if it wasn't clear, my interest in pottery is minimal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, right. It was, that wasn't Cypriot pottery. It was like local. Right. So if, if the pottery was imported from Cyprus, then it's a 1450s time period-ish. If the pottery was made locally, then it could have been any date. Uh, whatsoever. Um, so Kathleen Kenyon, so from the chat, Kathleen Kenyon did not find expensive Cypriot pottery in Jericho uh, in a poor part of the city, which is why she didn't date it to the 15th century. Uh, so in short, the um, uh, Garstang was excavating a part of the city that was more rich and could probably afford imported pottery. Uh, Kenyon was excavating a poorer part of the city which could not afford that pottery. She didn't find the Cypriot pot pottery. Garstang did find the pottery. So Kenyon interpreted it as um, uh, that Garstang's layer was uh, newer, and the early date response is no, Garstang's layer was richer, um, and they could afford it. That's the argument. And so I guess the whole conquest thing does boil down to whether or not there's a legitimate reason to have a shift in the carbon-14 dating. Yeah, I, I think that's really where the... Um, I don't want to say more serious argument is, uh, because I do, I, I mean, you know, pottery analysis is like a serious thing, and it, and it has been used for um, well over 100 years. But I think that once you start talking about very, um, it's one thing to go back and forth on pottery. It's another thing entirely to say that the uh, uh, radio, that to basically talk about the mechanisms of radiometric decay and how that there needs to be a 200-year shift. Um, that's why, personally, I've I've been very, I've not been persuaded by that argument myself, uh, because I think that 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 borders on being um, a little too. It, it, it commits you to too much, you know, because you're starting to question things that I think are more established than pottery at that point. But that's my own personal assessment as a biomedical engineer with exactly zero experience in pottery or radiometric dating. All right, any other uh, comments or questions or suggestions? Input? There is that new book coming out. Ah, yes. There is a book called, coming out called Exodus Five Views, which goes into all five views. Um, the early date, the late date, the Levite hypothesis, the it didn't happen hypothesis, and the fifth one. Cultural, that the... Cultural memory, right? Is one I don't know. I, think. I, I don't know. OK, well, um, I think that's a good place to. Oh, to uh, sorry. Uh, th why doesn't the cultural memory apply to this discussion? So um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the, the, the conquest is actually related in, in like Psalm 78, for example, uh, relates the entire history of uh, the Exodus and the conquest. Now, there are two issues with that. The first is that it is textually dependent on these accounts anyway, so it's not sure that it's cultural memory. The other thing is that the Exodus gives a unified central story, more or less, that is then communicated uh, through, um, through the people. Whereas the conquest, as we have been arguing extensively, has a variegated portrait to the point where traditions and cultural memories that are embedded could be taken to be contradictory. Case in point, the wandering Aramean as my father is, it, that, think about that, Deuteronomy 26, a wandering Aramean was my father. He went down into Egypt 
from which the Lord delivered him. That contains the Exodus, but before and after the Exodus is uh, hard, it's hard to say. So the, the, the cultural memories actually, again, you could say that they contradict, but I, more charitably, they are not homogenous. Okay, um, I appreciate your time. I know we went long on a very difficult and uh, arduous topic, but I really appreciate it. Uh, rem reminder that next week we will be meeting on campus, MSC 2406, where we'll be going to the um, talk with uh, uh, Dominic Legg. The week after that, we will finally get to the objection of what do we do, how does God command anything like leave alive nothing that breathes? And how on earth can we uh, put those words on the lips of Jesus, for example? So that's what we'll talk about in two weeks. And then after that, I don't remember the rest of the schedule. So. <laughs> Thank you. We'll end there.